<laughs> All right. Um, good to know. Good to know. Uh, yeah, we get, we've gotten kind of a shift in the audiences over the years. It used to be we get guys that um, all thought they were amazing at game because they'd read all the theory online, and then they couldn't approach a girl to save their lives and like were like the biggest hard cases ever. <clears throat> now we get a bunch of like really cool guys who actually like are sort of decent with girls, but they're like, oh, I don't know all the advanced theory, and they're like, I'm a beginner. How many guys, girls are you with? Oh, 60. I'm like, what the fuck, really? You know what I mean? Um, so, you know, you get the different, different stuff. Cool, cool. Uh, all right, what I want to talk to you guys about today is, is basically three concepts that don't really seem all that related, but they, they are on kind of a deep fundamental level, and they all kind of build into each other. Uh, the first concept is the, the concept of sort of like shit happens and how do you deal with it in life. Uh, the second concept is the concept of standing out versus fitting in. Uh, and the third concept, uh, Kevin actually kind of mentioned the story, I'll, I'll address it, is pulling the hottest girl in the bar. All right, and I'll actually talk about that particular story that, that he was mentioning, which is in London, uh, and how it all kind of came together and how it worked out, and then sort of similar uh, circumstances I've had in the past. Um, but just to tell you, um, this is going to sound like I'm complaining about my day, but uh, just go with it for a minute, all right? You know, I'm in a position where I get to like complain about my day and have a room full of people listen, so I'm lucky, I guess. Um, but just to tell you a little bit of like the process of me getting here today, it's normally a lot smoother than this, but so we had a red eye flight with a, a screaming, not even a screaming baby, like a screaming four year old, right? Uh, and like in the, in the seat with a parent, like literally wrestling, like literally wrestling around for a good like 40 minutes on the, on the flight and screaming and I've never, I've never heard a human being scream this loud continuously <laughs> the entire time. Um, <clears throat> get off, get in, okay. Um, first thing I do in DC, I lose my phone. Right? I was like sitting in the taxi, I was wearing like basketball shorts, and like fell out of my shorts. I always check the taxi, but there's like one time I didn't, I lose my phone. Um, we get to the hotel, we're told we can't, we're like, it's like 10 o'clock in the morning, we haven't uh, slept really all night, I'm told we can't check in till like three. <laughs> I had to like negotiate with the front desk and like get them to like let us check in and stuff like that. They were actually friendly in the end. Um, but it was just like just a series of little calamities one after another after another. And it would have been very easy during any one of those to like, you know, flip out or get, get bent out of shape or get stressed or whatever. Um, but one thing that I think successful people do in life and especially successful people do in game that other people don't <clears throat> is they really draw a distinction between what they can affect and what they can change and what they can't. And to truly not stress out about the things you can't change is, I guess it's, it's a skill, it's a talent, but it's absolutely essential in life. It is absolutely essential and there are things you can't change and you need to accept them. But that said, the things that you can change in life, you need to be very, very harsh on yourself and make sure you do them right, okay? So let's look at this in a game, pers uh, game context or game perspective. Um, if you are new to game and you walk up to a girl and get blown out, do you have a lot of control over that at this stage in your game? Probably not. Probably you went up, you did the best you could, you're like stumbling and stammering and just trying to like get over the fact that you're like terrified talking to her and you're doing the best you can and you're gonna get rejections. Even if you're at an advanced level in game, you walk up to a girl and you get rejected, a lot of times you don't have a ton of control of that, right? Now you might, it might be that you ran a bad set, it might be that you <clears throat> walked up kind of half-assed, it might be that you didn't have enough like volume in your speech, it might be a lot of different things, but it also might be that she has a boyfriend who's five feet away from her and it would be incredibly awkward for her to give you a good response. You don't necessarily know that. Or it might be that her grandmother died that day and she's having like the worst night ever of her life and she just like, like literally just doesn't want to talk to anybody and it doesn't matter who you are. Like you could literally almost be Brad Pitt and she'd be just be like, Brad, why tonight? Just no, right? Um, so there are things outside of your control in game. Hey, that said, anything and everything you can control, you should. Meaning when you walk up, you need to have that proper tonality. You need to have that proper eye contact. You need to ideally offer value. You need to do all these things. And what that does is it means that on a percentage basis, on a like likelihood, probability, statistical basis, you're going to get a good result more often than if you didn't do it right. But that said, when things don't go your way, having the right attitude is paramount. Because if every single time something doesn't go your way in game, you're like, shit, why do I suck at life? Why am I bad with girls? Why am I no fun? 
why am I uncharismatic? What is your brain going to start doing? Your brain's very smart, and your brain likes having right answers. Like we've been taught from young kids to have the right answer when asked questions. So if you say, why am I a loser, your brain's going to go, well, you're a loser because <laughs> da, 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 right? And it's going to start telling you every reason why you're a loser. And that's the feedback you're going to be giving yourself. You're like, why do I suck with women? Well, I suck with women because I'm, you know, I'm short, I'm pasty, I'm not in the best shape, I'm not rich, da, 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 whatever, right? And that's not the feedback you want to be giving yourself. What you want to be doing in a weird way is to be utterly and totally narcissistic about your successes and your failures, actually, but at the same time practical. It's a weird mix. It's a very weird mix. So every time you succeed, you should be thinking, fuck yeah, I'm the man. Girls love me. I have an 18 inch penis, even though it only looks like, like four to me is fucking 18 <laughs> in the real world, right? Like you need to, that's how you should be thinking like all the time when things are going your way. It's always your fault. It's always because you're the man. It's always because you're amazing. Why? Because that's going to feed into your self-esteem. That's going to feed into your self-belief. And that's actually tangibly going to help you in the future. When things don't go your way. Oh, no, she was in a bad mood. Ah, oh, she probably had a boyfriend, right? Oh, yeah, the friends, just the really tough logistics, whatever it happens, right? For the most part, that's what you should be thinking emotionally and psychologically. Also, that's what you should be thinking in the field. Right? In the field, at the time of, it wasn't your fault, you did the best you could, on to the next. However, when you get home that night, or when you get home after like three or four days of going out, or a week of going out, and you notice trends, you notice that over and over again, uh, you can open, you have a good first minute, and then it kind of goes dead. At that point, you have to be very harsh on yourself, and you have to realize that what you get in life is a product of what you're putting in, and you have to say, what am I putting in that's getting me that result? What am I doing after that first minute that's messing it up? And at that moment, you don't sit there and be like, um, I'm the man, I'm the shit, I'm, I'm incredible, I'm unbeatable, because you have tangible evidence to the contrary. Right? That's the time to figure it out, that's the time to fix it, and then you go back out, and you know, next time you go out, I'm the man. And guess what, I'm even more the man, because I fixed that thing I was doing wrong. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, there's a great phrase that I got from, uh, it's probably been said a million times, but I got it from Zig Ziglar. Uh, and he says, failure is an event, not a person. Okay? That's a very, very good phrase to have in game. Failure is an event, not a person. You had a bad set, you're not a bad person. You were kind of lame one night, you're not a lame person. Right? That's how you want to view things. Okay? So, um, and, and view it as you're building towards something. You're building towards something. You should not expect the world of yourself the first time out. That's not a fair way to go about things. How many people in this room ever played sports? Raise your hands. How many people were amazing at the sport the first time you touched a ball or like stepped on the track or whatever it was? How many people were amazing the first time? Like two people? <laughs> All right, well, we have like the natural, uh, naturals in the room. Um, most people are not. How many people, even, even those of you who were really good the first time, how many of you got better once you practiced? Yeah? No? <laughs> you went out one time, you were great, and you just like, no improvement from then. Huh? Only first grade. Only first grade? You were like the, like the fastest kid in school, and then it all downhill from there. <laughs> one of those, pretty much. All right, fair enough. It happens. It happens. No, it's cool. It's, it's very cool as a young kid to be like the fastest kid in school, right? They're like the, the fastest or the strongest. I was always like the second or third at everything. I was like the second or third fastest, second or third. It always pissed me off. Um, okay. Uh, in any case, yeah, you, you, it's, un, it's not reasonable to expect to be amazing at something when you first start out. How many people the first time you saw a book you knew how to read it? No? Nobody? Really? Okay, cool. Well, there's a progression in everything. There's a progression in everything worth doing in life. Every skill worth having, um, every skill at least that sets you apart from other people, you probably don't have it naturally. Because if you had it naturally, probably everybody had it naturally. Okay? So every time it's tough, you should actually love that. You should actually be really happy that things were tough because that's your opportunity to set yourself apart. Right? But also, don't be, don't be hard on yourself. Don't be down on yourself for not being great at game. It's not fair to assume that <clears throat> when you're starting out at this that you're going to walk out and be amazing at it. Not fair to assume it. Now, some people will be. Some people will be because they got lucky in life. Some people will be because they got certain positive feedback as a kid and it fed into their self-esteem. Or certain people will be because they were raised in an environment with like a bunch of salespeople and they learned how to be a closer growing up, right? Um, and now those are the people that, that were lucky.
but if you weren't lucky enough to have that like fortuitous set of like you know lightning struck you in the right way events you're not going to be great the first time that doesn't mean that you can't learn it that doesn't mean you can't get great also in a weird way you're luckier if it's not easy for you at first in a way you're luckier because if it's easy for you if it all comes natural you will be good to a point but you won't learn the process of getting good right you won't necessarily get that whereas if you suck you have this need to get good you have something that is um, this like achy inside of you and you, you have that desperation you're gonna figure it out and once you figure out the process that process is far more valuable than the result that's why guys in the pickup community can get better at game than most naturals right that's why like there are there are a lot of guys who are naturally cooler than I am more charismatic than I am better looking than I am um, had more probably there are a lot of guys even that have slept with more girls than I have but I have better game than them now I have more possibility than them because I had to learn it the hard way right I had to learn it the hard way because in a lot of ways I wasn't very good at it starting off and I had to learn a process and once you get that process down that's where you're gonna really see those results okay um, <coughs> so what I really want to get across to you out of all that though is I want you to look at obstacles in, in a different way. I want you to look at obstacles as good things. Look at obstacles as ways to learn and to grow. And I want you to take a long timeline with the things you want to be good at in life. All right? Um, who in this room is over 60? Who in this room is over 50? One person. Okay, cool. Um, over 40? Okay, a couple. One? Oh, just one there. Okay, cool. So. I will tell you guys, and this even is for the guys that are in the 40s and 50s, but especially for everybody who's even younger than that, that you guys have years and years and years to get good at game. Okay? I have had a girl stolen from me by a guy who must have been 70. <laughs> okay? I'm not kidding. It was embarrassing. Um, but the guy, I mean, the guy had decades of experience. What could I do? Um, it's happened. It's actually kind of a funny story. I'll, I'll, I'll relate it to you just because it's amusingly bad. <laughs> so this was when I was, this was about probably eight, eight or, probably eight, about eight years ago. Um, and so I'm talking to these girls. And at the time I had this thing that I would do. I, I sort of would be, I had my normal way of communicating and then I had game mode. And in game mode, I would sort of like adopt a little bit of a playerish eye contact. And I'd kind of look at the girl kind of side on. It would be a little, it was my way of showing intent. Right? It was a little unnatural, it was a little like, um, a little try hard in its way, but it got the message across and it worked. And so I'd be talking to the girls, like, <laughs> <laughs> like a little of that when I'm talking to them, right? It just was what I did. So I'm talking to these girls, it's going well, uh, it's three girls in probably their early 20s, <coughs> and um, going well, they're laughing in all the right places, they're giggling, they seem to like me. I'm liking where it's going. This is actually um, on, is in Leicester Square in London. So it's like kind of like a street environment, like a street mixed with like a park, if that makes sense at all, like an open plaza. Uh, and then all of a sudden, as I'm talking to these girls and it's going well, they laugh at like the wrong place in my story. Like I'm in the middle of like building up some, to something and they just laugh in the middle. I'm like, that was weird. And it kind of throws me off for a second and then I get back to talking. And then uh, about, I don't know, like five or 10 seconds later, they laugh again. I was like, what's going on here? And I noticed they're all kind of looking over this way. So I look back here and I see this old guy standing behind me. But he's not doing anything, he's just like standing there. He's like standing a little closer than you would expect in like a normal situation, but it's like, all right, whatever. So I just like step in front of him and just like keep talking, right? And then, I don't know, five or 10 seconds later, they start laughing. Now they're looking over here. I look over, the old guy's over there. I'm like, what the fuck's going on, right? <laughs> and I look back and then I look back at him again and he's going like this, like, <laughs> like, like making fun of like my mannerism, right? Um, and so I'm like, cool man, anyway. And then I talk and I'm trying not to do it, but I'm getting a little self-conscious. And then uh, I notice them all looking over here. The guy comes over and he kind of like backs into me and goes like this, like b bumps his butt into me. He's like, come on girls, let's get out of here. And the girls all just walk off with him. It was unbelievable. The guy was like 70. Uh, so, I mean, well played. I was saying like, well, that sucks. <laughs> um, point is, for every single person here, um, they say that your best set today will be your average set in six months. And it's very, very true. If you're a beginner, it's a much shorter timeline than that. Your best set now might, might be your average set in like a month, okay? 
The point is, if you apply yourself properly, you can get really good at this really quickly. So try not to think of this as, I have to get the girl tonight, or I have to be amazing at this right now. Try and think of this as, here's my opportunity to learn and grow, because when I have learned and grown, I will get this girl that I maybe may get on my best night now, I'll be getting her over and over and over and over again. And that's what you're really looking for. You're not in game to get that one 10 by luck. You're in game to get to the point where you get 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. Or at the very least, like 10s are hard to find. So like 9, 9, that's, that's, that, that's OK. That's OK too. Right? Um, but that's, that's what you want to get to. You want to get to that point where it's consistent and where it's reliable. Because the fact of the matter is, if, if it was that, that one girl that you stretched and got by luck, you'll probably lose her. Right? You probably, you know, if you had to be lucky to get her, probably some guy's going to come along eventually who doesn't have to be lucky to get that girl, and he's going to steal her from you. But if you're the guy that can get that girl eventually, like over and over and over again, then um, if you do lose, you can always replace her. And you're going to have the confidence and the abundance that you won't get needy, you won't get weird. And fortunately or unfortunately, it's gonna, the process is going to force you to become a cooler and cooler person. And you will become the type of guy who she really wants to be with. Right? So that's what you really want to look to in game. Right? The results night to night are important. And you want to play to the bitter end and be brutally, viciously competitive each night as well right? along the way. But that said, understand that it's a long-term thing. Right? It's like if you go to go back to the sports metaphor, um, say that you're a, a very talented like 10-year-old athlete. Very, very talented 10-year-old athlete. Now, every single time you go out and play, you want to you train hard, you want to practice hard, you want to play your best, you want to play to win, because that's how you improve and that's how you grow. And it's also like there's, there's beauty and virtue in winning along the way, for sure. But if your goal is to be a professional athlete, the result of a game at age 10 is not really going to make a big difference in whether you make it or don't make it as a pro athlete. Right? Let's be fair about that. It's the same thing in game. The result of every night, you should go hard. You should play it right, because that's how you learn, and that's how you get the best results. And also, you know, in, in, you, know, you get the wins along the way, which are great. Like sex with amazing girls, amazing girlfriends along the way is amazing. It's, it's wonderful, too. But understand that the result of any one night doesn't make or break you in game. It's the, the habits you build and the learning process that you build. Okay? So I want you to really, really look to it um, that way. Okay, next concept. Totally unrelated, you would think, is the concept of standing out versus fitting in. Right? It's very, very easy, um, well, relatively more easy to fit in than to stand out, at least emotionally. Right? If you don't fit into society, if you don't fit in with a particular demographic, what's going to happen? People will give you a hard time, people will make fun of you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So most people, the vast majority of people, almost by like what the definition of fitting in is, fit in, at least to some niche. Right? Even if you are some weird niche of like, um, like hyper nerdy hipster gamer type or whatever, within that niche of the people like that, you probably fit in with your niche or your crew or whatever. Right? Or if you're a lawyer, you probably fit in to a certain extent with other lawyers. Et cetera, et cetera, whatever the particular niche is. And most people globally sort of fit in with society. Like you will notice that nobody came shirtless tonight. Right? Now, it's possible the hotel wouldn't have let you in had you come shirtless, but it wasn't even consideration. Right? It wasn't like, oh, that's my look, that's what I'm doing, I decided to stand out. Right? Nobody made that decision tonight. Right? Why? Because, well, one is kind of pointless. That's like standing out for no point, whatever. But it's also more work and more hassle. It's more work and more hassle than fitting in would be. Okay? Here's another example. Um, say you have, um, I don't know exact car prices, so I'm just I'm roughing this. this. Is what I was kind of thinking in the back room, though. Um, say you have like you know 60 or 70 grand to spend on a car. Now, what do most people do with that? They buy like uh, in this country BMW, Mercedes, or Lexus. Those are probably like the most common choices someone makes for that price point. Fair enough. And if you were to buy one of those cars for that price point, could anybody really say, like, weird fucking guy? Why the fuck would he do that? Why, like, would, who the fuck does he think he is, et cetera? Right? Probably not. Probably not. Probably, like, some people that have, like, no money to spend on a car think you're, like, ostentatious for buying a luxury car instead of buying, like, like a Honda or a Kia or something like that. 
But like nobody's really thinking like particular things about you because of that. Nobody's like, oh my god, I'll particularly single him out. Let's say instead you buy, uh, I don't know if you guys know, like, this is like a, like a Lotus or something like that. Like a little tiny bright fucking sports car. <laughs> All right? Probably like that comes in only two seater and doesn't have a trunk. All right? And so you get it in like lime green. <laughs> okay? Now, that's a, that's a different decision for, it's probably actually a little less expensive, but same, similar kind of price point, all right? Now, if a girl saw two guys, one is driving the Lotus, and one is driving a BMW, same price point, which is she gonna notice more? Lotus. Yeah, which is she gonna think, oh, cool, I wanna ride in his car more? Pro the probably the Lotus, right? Really? Probably, huh? <laughs> Who said really? This is DC. <laughs> this is DC. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay, let's assume we're in Miami or LA for a second. Uh, I would I would even say here though that there will be more intrigue around the car that she hasn't seen before, the car that seems more like fun out there, whatever. I, I would I would even go so far as to say in DC that's still probably the case to a certain extent. Although I don't live here, you guys do, so you guys can correct me on that later if you'd like. Um, the point is though, one stands out, one fits in, right? But what is the sacrifice? What is the sacrifice you make there? You're making a few sacrifices. Number one, you're making the sacrifice of um, your friends might give you shit about it. Right? Your friends are like, ah, who the hell do you think you are? Ah, we got like uh, Mario Andretti here, right? Shit like that. People might make fun of you. Secondly, um, it is impractical. It is highly impractical. If you go for like, I don't, I don't know this for sure, but if you go for like a big grocery run or you go to like, go pick up something at a hardware store and your car doesn't have a trunk, that's a pain in the ass. If you have a car that has two seats instead of five and you want to go take your friends all somewhere, that's a pain in the ass. Right? And so it's funny because you're making this trade-off if you go with that choice. I'm not telling you should buy one car or buy the other car, by the way. This is not like a, a car sales presentation. <laughs> all right? I personally would buy the luxury car myself. Right? I personally would because I don't give a fuck and that's not how I choose to be ostentatious. Um, and I also don't think you need that to pick up girls. But the point still stands. Um, the one would make a bigger impression, moment to moment, if a girl saw it. The other is more practical, less of a pain in the ass in life, more useful, gets better gas mileage, probably brakes get down less, probably you don't bottom it out every time you go over a speed bump, shit like that, right? So you're making this decision practical versus ostentatious slash potentially like attractive because it stands out, right? And the interesting thing I want to point out to you is that you will never stand out by fitting in. That sounds obvious. That sounds like a, almost a definition, right? You'll never stand out by fitting in. But that is the case. You'll never stand out by fitting in better than someone else. You know, you, if, you're, if you're the most average, like the most stereotypical, <laughs> like white, right? you won't stand out that way. You won't get attention, okay? Now, attention isn't always necessarily the best thing, right? If you get attention and then like you can't handle it, and you're inherently lame or self-conscious or whatever, it's not going to work to your benefit. But if you are the type of person that once you have that attention, you're going to convey yourself in an attractive way, you're going to turn it into something good, then attention is better than a lack of attention. Okay? Um, and that's why we had theories. Uh, for example, you guys may have heard of a theory called peacocking back in the day, pickup community. <laughs> peacocking basically, and it's actually a good theory, um, and if taken within a reasonable range is still a very good theory. There's, you can definitely go too far with it. But um, the idea of peacocking basically is that you want to wear, clothing-wise, a few interesting items. Right? You want to have a few things that make you stand out or that a girl could comment on, that sort of thing. Right? Now you may notice that I'm not necessarily wearing anything that particularly stands out at the, at the moment. There was a time when I did. There was a time when, like many, many, many years ago, before I ever actually taught pickup, but when I was doing it, um, if you'd seen me out in the field, you would have seen me with nail polish on. You would have seen me with a feather bow around my neck and or maybe a zebra striped cowboy hat. Right? I've had, I had a pink cowboy hat as well until some AMOG destroyed it because I stole his girlfriend in it. Um, <laughs> but the, the point is I've done all these different things. And the reason why I did them was that they worked to a point. They worked in a way. And the whole theory with, with peacocking and all this was it's better to be looked over than overlooked, right? It's better to have attention than not, right? If you, especially if you're doing good things, let's say you're in a nightclub and you're talking to some girls over in a corner and it's going really well. Now, if you're dressed average, normal, whatever, they just think that, that somebody looks over, they just think, oh, they're all friends, they're having a good time. 
if you're dressed in a pink cowboy hat and girl looks over and sees a bunch of other girls like laughing and talking to you or whatnot, then now she actually noticed it because it registered in her mind as an event. Right? Uh, quick question, how many people remember their drive to work today or to school? Not very many, but it happened just today. Just happened today. How many people remember their first kiss? More, but that was so long ago. Why do you remember that when you don't remember something that happened today? Because it was memorable. Because it stood out. Because it was an event for you. Okay? So if you are in the bar and you look a little weird, or you look in a way that catches attention, someone notices you and that's an event, they keep an eye on you a little bit. And then if you're doing cool things and having a lot of attention on you in a positive way, they continue to notice it and it actually builds up their perception of you. On the other hand, if you look that way and everybody's rejecting you and telling you you're a loser, people <laughs> notice that too. Right? So the idea with peacocking was basically put attention on yourself. If there's more attention on you and you're doing the right things, that attention is only a good thing. Right? And to a point, it's definitely good. And I do agree that like, having a look definitely helps. If, uh, if any of you ever go to uh, Vegas, is a particular example of this, um, you will see a preponderance of really hot girls with guys who have like sleeves of tattoos. Right? That's a particular choice they've made. That's a particular thing they did that stands out. Right? And um, the reason why guys like that get a lot of hot girls is, uh, well, twofold. Number one, well, okay, we'll go to number one. We'll, we'll do it reversed. Uh, number one, if you do that, you've kind of burned your boats. You've said, I'm living a certain lifestyle. I'm living a lifestyle of I don't give a fuck what people think about me. Because when you start getting a ton of tattoos, especially if you get like neck tattoos and shit like that, right? You're precluding certain jobs, right? You're saying there are certain jobs I'm never going to get. I have made this decision in life. I've gone down this road. I've taken a big risk. And if you're doing well in life, in spite of it, in spite of taking that big risk, I was enough to overcome that. I was enough that in spite of people potentially making fun of me, in spite of me like burning certain bridges, burning, burning the boats, etc., and I've succeeded, now I must be that much more alpha. It's literally the theory of the peacock. Right? You guys all know why the peacock has the, the bright feathers? Yeah, you guys know? Right. Exactly. Well, it's, it's, that's what it comes from like chemically, yes. Okay, so let's, let's go to this, right? The peacock. Um, peacock has bright feathers. Do the bright feathers help it to not get eaten by a predator? Yes or no? No. Do they hurt it in the, in the sense of getting eaten by a predator? Yes or no? Yes. yes. Okay. So the feathers themselves convey two things. Number one, what he said is diet. Right? In order for the peacock to make that color biologically, it has to eat a healthy diet. It has to be getting nutrients in its food and it has to be well fed. So by having those colors, it's communicating to the peahen, I'm well fed, I'm healthy. The peahen wants to have the sperm of a well-fed, healthy peacock. That's number one. Number two, though, is it's saying, in a way, um, not only am I fit enough to survive, I'm fit enough to survive in spite of basically putting a sign on my back that says, eat me. Right? If it can survive in spite of that, now it's saying to the peahen, I'm going to pass along genes to you that are that good. Okay? So that's the same thing with these guys with the tattoos. So number one reason is that. Number two reason, which actually builds on it, is that the girl in her life, or a lot of girls in her life, they've met certain guys that are this type, this sort of like outcast, um, or voluntary outcast, nonconformist, I do what the fuck I want, I do things my own way type. Um, and probably she had good experiences with them. Or in the media, there are guys like that. Like celebrities can get away with that a lot. So she has good associations with them, and then that becomes her type. Right? That becomes a type because it was a positive factor and then she latched onto it. And then these girls, a lot of these girls have that type of like, I like guys with tattoos. Right? And why is it? Because she likes that particular way of carrying herself. She likes that particular way of standing out. Now, can you pick up these girls if you don't have tattoos? Yes or no? Yes. 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 Would it be easier if you did? Yes. yes. Cool. Are there other girls for whom having tattoos would be an immediate turnoff and they'd consider a deal breaker? Yes or no? Yes. yes. Okay. So I'm not telling you. I'm not telling you go buy a lotus. I'm not telling you go get tattoos. Okay. Let's 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 be clear about all that. All right. But I do want you to understand the phenomenon that occurs with these types of subcommunication. I want you to understand where people's attention are, is drawn and how people view these different sorts of things. Okay. The next thing I want you to understand in this this overall like un, like view of the world is understand 
that most men who have lived and died on planet Earth did not have kids. Understand that. In fact, it's not like more than half didn't. It's like 80% didn't. Okay? It's actually more than that even. Right? In modern-ish times, 80% didn't. In historical times, there have been uh, lengthy periods of, of history of almost the, all of Europe where um, one man in 17 procreated. Okay? Most extreme example, there was a civilization in Central America, I think it's either South or Central America, where literally 1% of the male population procreated. Basically, 1% was in this royal ruling class that was allowed to have sex. The other 99% of men were not allowed to have sex. If they did have sex, it was a crime punishable by death to them and their entire family. Okay? So these are, these are the conditions that have existed historically. Right? So understand that most men historically live and die without um, passing their genes along. And what that means is a lot of them, not quite as many as that like 80% ratio, but a high ratio as well, live and die without ever having sex. Okay? Now what does that imply? What does that imply? It implies that historically being average is not attractive for a man. Right? A woman wants what good genes for her kids, wants the genes of the guy that has the, you know, the get into the next generation trait. Right? Um, and in order to do that, if he's in that average 80%, he does not have it. Right? So it behooves men to stand out. It behooves men, think of it this way. Um, if 80% of men are not having kids, and then one man in um, one man in five is that, that's the ratio. One man in five is having on average ten or twenty or thirty kids, right? Because what will happen is you'll have anyway. I don't need to go into all the math of it. The point is, one man's having a lot of kids. A lot of guys are having no kids, right? It's a massive benefit in terms of evolution for a guy to try and stand out. It's a massive benefit for a guy to go to war and be a conquering hero. It's a massive benefit for a guy to um, figure out a way to rise in the hierarchy and, and, and gain rank, to gain a knighthood or gain like royalty or gain whatever, to become something big, right? Because the difference between um, trying for something big and failing and dying genetically and living your life without trying is basically the same, right? It's the same result. The average result for men historically is failed. Failed at genetics. Failed at, like, failed at life in a way, you could say, right? That's like the average result historically for a man from a genetic perspective, right? So if the average is failing, you want to play high risk, high reward, and give yourself a chance to stand out. Now, nowadays, a much higher percentage of guys do have kids. Much, much, much higher than it has ever been before because there is much more affluence, there's many more resources being spread around, especially in first world countries, um, a very high percentage relative to history are having kids. So now, average guys actually can have kids. However, if you want the most attractive girls, if you want abundance, women are still wired the way they were wired all throughout history, which means they're wired to go after the guy that stands out. Right? The woman is wired to be more attracted to the guy that stands out and is amazing and impresses her and will cheat on her and be bad to her and all kinds of other things than she is to go for that safe, nice, average guy who fits in. Okay? She's just wired for that. And it doesn't necessarily make as much sense nowadays as it ever did before. It still makes a little sense. It still makes a little sense biologically for them. But it's kind of illogical now. But you have to look at it in the context of history. It's totally logical. And that's what women should do. That's how women should be. Okay? So what does this imply about the way that you should be in game, the way that you should run sets, etc.? Well, it implies that um, something that Derek said, which I really like. He said, if I talk to 20 women, I don't care if 19 of them hate me and wish me dead. As long as number 20 thinks I walk on water. Okay? Now, there's two concepts there. First is the concept that it doesn't matter if 19 hate you if one likes you. It doesn't matter how many failures because, especially you know, in the big societies we live in now, the failures just go away, the successes last. The successes become your girlfriends, become your relationships, whatever, become at least a fun night. 
at the very least, right? And the, the failures forget you, right? I know many, many stories of guys who have approached the same girl on like either on in the same night mm -hmm. and had it fail the first time and succeed the second time, or approached a girl once and then approached her weeks or months later and had it work, right? It happens, they forget you, right? So they, the, the, the failures literally don't matter. It's like playing, uh, playing baseball without any like called strikes. You just swing and swing and swing until you hit something, <laughs> right? Basically. So only successes matter, that's important. But the second part of that that's really important is that last part. Not that she, he doesn't care if 19 hate him, if 20 likes him. No, no, if number 20 thinks I walk on water, okay? What does he want? He doesn't want the girl to merely like him a little bit. He doesn't want the girl to be like, oh, he's pretty okay, whatever. She, he wants the girl to think he walks on water because that's what creates the great relationship. In fact, his philosophy, which is a little different than mine, but he basically has decided when he picks up a girl, he wants every shit test that, he's gonna give, uh, that she's going to give him for the entire relationship. He wants them all in the first hour. <laughs> Basically, he wants to like just, it's like, um, like a taming a horse almost. Like the horse is going to buck and buck and buck. And at a certain point, they realize they just can't get you off or whatever. That's weirdly sexual. But anyway, <laughs> it realizes that it's, you're, it's, it's pointless. It's pointless to give you shit tests. It's pointless to do this stuff. And it just like gives in and just like, okay, fine, you win. The relationship is whatever you want it to be. And he can lead the relationship from there. That's how he wants it. Because he feels like that's the best use of his time. He doesn't want to deal with a girl giving him shit tests three months down the line or a month down the line or two years, whatever. He wants it all out of the way, first hour. If he loses girls in the process, he doesn't care because the ones that are on, he wants them really, really on. Now, I don't take quite that extreme of a view of it, but philosophically and in general, that's the right way to look at it. Okay? That's how you want to look at it. The goal in game is not to fit in. It's to stand out in a positive way. If you stand out in a negative way, you're the guy getting rejected all over the bar in the pink cowboy hat. That's not good either. <laughs> right, but <laughs> if you are getting positive responses, it's a good thing. Right. Um, quick last final thought on just to get back to the whole peacocking thing. Um, you can go too far with it. You can go too far because if you go beyond a certain point, now it looks like a gimmick or it looks try hard. Right. The other important criteria of game is that it has to feel like it just happened. It has to feel like you. Um, got the girl because she chose you in a way or because like um, because of something genuine rather than out of an attempt or a manipulation so if he gets too if you get too clownish or too outside of the realm of reality that actually works against you and the girls will still be attracted to you but they will tend to like not feel comfortable around you and not trust you because it seems manipulative it seems weird right so that's where that borderline of like peacocking goes too far right but a little bit a little bit of having a look is a good thing so uh, just to round out the idea of like look and vibe and that kind of stuff, what I suggest to people <coughs> is um, look around at two things. First, look at guys, kind of have a catalog in your head, and think to yourself as you look at a guy, does that guy get laid? Right? Does that guy get laid? And there are a lot of categories of guys that get laid. There are guys in suits that get laid. Right? There are guys in like biker jackets that get laid. There are guys in t-shirts and jeans that get laid. There are a lot of different categories. And it's not like you have to choose one category, but you can definitely tell the guys that are getting it and the guys that aren't. Number one, if you see them walking with hot girls or making out with hot girls, that's a good indicator. But also, you just kind of can tell. You can tell by the way they walk. You can tell by the way they carry themselves. You can tell. So get a catalog in your head of guys that are getting laid. And then specifically, look at the girls that you want. Look at the girls that you're into. The girls are like, oh my god, if I only had her. Look at those girls and look at what type of guys they're with. Right? And then what you want to do is emulate that to the best of your ability. Emulate that look. Um, and if you can make it your own, that's great, but you don't even have to. Right? Be whatever niche that stands out in that way and do it well, do it right, and have the look. Have the look, all right? So what I like to say, there's this phrase in community, like, looks don't matter. It's largely true. I mean, if you have like a massive red bump growing out of your head or something like that, or like you're, you know, like, two feet tall or something like that, there, there, are, there are times when looks matter. I will be fair, right? If you are like, like horrendously obese to the point where you can't like leave your house without like leaning on something, <laughs> looks matter, right? But for most of us within a normal range looks wise, looks don't matter that much. What matters is your look and the way you carry yourself. Do you carry yourself with the confidence that goes along with it? Okay, so that's the idea with peacocking is do something to stand out a little bit 
stand out in a way that's appropriate for the vibe you're trying to convey and what you're doing. Um, and then be noticed. Be noticed just a little bit. Right? Just enough. Just enough to not appear shy. That's the ideal as far as that goes.